Everybody's talking about the housing market. What's going to happen to it? It's actually extremely complicated. However, I'll make it very, very simple. Do you feel that these stimulus packages are actually hurting the markets more than taking care of the markets? Oh, 100%. They're, they're making it worse. That money is costing them 10 times that. Are people just going to get used to it? Are people just going to expect the helicopter to drop $2 trillion every year, or every six months? We talk about this, it's known as inflation. And everyone says, there's no inflation. Well, explain to me then how the gas prices have doubled. Explain to me how the grocery store, you go and buy food and stuff now. And the prices have gone up and the packages have shrunk. You're a landlord, I'm a landlord. People who are watching this are landlords. But I know many people have been affected where the last year, they have not collected rent. This is what happened during the last recession as well, which I went through. I've even got a lot of landlords in some of my agencies who have said, Neil, as soon as we can evict these tenants, that's it, I'm putting it on the market. So we've already got loads of houses prepped. What's going on, everybody? I hope you're all having a great day and a blessed day. In today's video, I have a very special guest with me, known as Neil McCoy Ward. And this man is special for having 283,000 loyal subscribers. And on top of that, the CEO for a group of companies. And we have him with us today to discuss some crazy stuff happening in the market, such as the housing market, forbearances and moratoriums, interest rates, why are prices so high, and just in general, what in the world is going on with the markets. Now, we're getting a different perspective from the man himself, Neil. We have him on this video right now. So, Neil, thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited to have you with us. Yeah, you're most welcome. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Definitely, definitely. So what I'm going to do is before we get into it, I'm going to ask for two things. Number one, everyone watching, any value that you get, please hit that like button. We got Neil spending his time, me spending my time to get this set up so all of you can enjoy content like this. And number two, link below, I started my new Discord channel. Come sign up, join it. We talk daily about real estate, money, and business. It's for free and you lose nothing. So that being said, Neil, I want from you 30 seconds to a minute of kind of who you are, what you got going on, and what you have going on in the markets in general. Um, okay, that's a bit of a curveball at me there, um, but uh, <laughs> uh, so, so I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a CEO of a, a group of companies, most of them in the real estate space. Uh, I have my YouTube channel. I do my mentoring, my Patreon, my, you know, I do loads of, you know, a dozen different hats for for what I do on a, a daily basis. But I've been in the real estate market since, you know, back in 2005 when I bought my first ever property um, and you guys will know it as a flip. So I bought it to flip it. And then because that's what everyone was doing, everyone was buying and flipping. But what I actually realized when I bought it and I was about to flip it, I stopped because I'm quite a critical thinker on most things. I stopped and I thought, why would I flip this and sell it and release that equity and then do it again when I can just remortgage it to 95% mm -hmm. and then keep that money and I've still got the house. So I didn't understand why everyone else was selling and doing the flip. So um, I did it that way and I grew a massive portfolio very, very quickly at a young age. By the age of, I don't know, 21, 22, I already had a a, a huge housing portfolio um, with, you know, what you would know as condos, we call them flats and things like that. And I just did it from that strategy, just buying them, fixer uppers, renovating them, and then remortgaging them, and then taking that money and doing the next property. So that's really how I got into it. And then I became an agent. I became a broker. Um, you know, I have an academy. So we have a training academy. It's mainly for European people, not so much American but a lot of Americans do my Airbnb course and, and things like that. So we have, I don't know, maybe five to 7,000 Academy members and, and things like that. But, you know, I don't want to talk about myself too much. I want to give a lot of value to the, to the viewers. So um, I'll end it there. Awesome. That's, that's beautiful. I didn't know about that too much in detail. That's, that's awesome to hear that you have all that going. Now, you told me when we were talking with each other that you are from the UK but you have a place in Cali and you're kind of flip-flopping between there. What's the story on that? Um, so for me, my wife's American. Mm -hmm. So of course, you know, I had a house, she had a place. So that's, there's no, you know, big mystery around it or anything like that. Um, I actually sold off my portfolio, my, my real estate portfolio. And I've been doing other stuff with my money since we can get into that if you want to later on. 
but um, you know, I always, uh, we're travelers basically. And it's ironic that we're at the Nomad Hotel today uh, <laughs> here in Las Vegas, because we are nomads in a way, we're digital nomads. So we travel a lot. Yes, we have our houses and we rent them on Airbnb when we're not staying there because they are quite nice houses. So they're easy to, to rent on Airbnb. And, uh, you know, I'd say one thing for everyone watching, if, if anyone has an interest in Airbnb and anything like that, it is definitely worth doing. You can make four times, five times as much as you would on a normal rental. So, um, yeah, just food for thought there. That's awesome. Okay. So Neil, we have, I mean, a lot of your videos talk about the housing market. A lot of them talk about, um, economy. A lot of them talk about just generally understanding how the world works and operates and, you're giving thousands and thousands of people uh, value. You're giving them your time and you're sharing so much. So everybody's talking about the housing market. What's going to happen to it? Are we expecting a crash? Are we expecting it to keep going up? What's really happening behind the scenes that we may, as normal people, not be able to see? I want to hear your take on that because so many, so many people have those questions. Yeah, sure. Well, it's actually extremely complicated However, I'll make it very, very simple. I think that's one of the things that people say about me. I take extremely complex topics in the finance world that might have sometimes two or 300 variables to it. And I can bring it down to, you know, within 10 parts, 10 steps. So what's happening? Well, there's really about four outcomes that could happen in the housing market right now. Number one is that it just explodes and keeps going up rapidly. Uh, number two is that it can sort of go up a little bit more this year. Um, or even just, you know, flatten out. And I'll come into money in a second and how this all, all works with currencies. Number three, it could drop a little bit. And then number four, you could see a massive correction. So let me just talk about corrections a second so that people understand the variables and the numbers here. Back in 1929 to 1938 sort of period, we had the Great Depression. So this is the end of the long-term debt cycle. So there aren't really many people that talk about the long-term debt cycle because it's so complex and most people never live through one. You know, by the time the next one comes about, those people who studied the first one and lived through it have died. So it's not something that's talked about a lot. A lot of economists don't study it because they think if it happens once every 70 or 100 years, what's the point in even studying it? I'll probably never use that information. So there's a few people, myself, Ray Dalio, um, Jim Ricards, we talk about it and we often re refer to it as a deleveraging. And this is where everything that you know as money, so if you take everything as money here, actually it's only a tiny slither of that that is real money. All the rest is just debt. So it, it's IOUs. And a lot of people don't understand, understand this concept. So if you take, um, and let me move into another point here to, to link this together. If you take a, a puddle of water that's just on the ground, and then you take a glass and you pour more water in, that puddle has to expand. It can't stay the same size because you've added more water to it. So right now what's going on is something called, you'll know, a stimulus, and they're stimulating the economy. So this is the Federal Reserve, specifically in the USA, I won't go into other countries, and they're pouring more water into the puddle. So what happens is when that money comes into the economy, and actually it doesn't go straight into the economy, it goes via the commercial banks first. And this is a key concept. This is why a lot of people said, why isn't the stimulus come out on the Tuesday? Why did it wait until the Friday? It's because of something called uh, reserve values with the, the commercial banks. They couldn't, I don't want to get too complex with it all, but they had to wait and get approval from the Federal Reserve for their reserves and, and all the other things going on here. But what happened is all this money then floods into the economy and it goes through investors and it goes through you know, regular people and it causes asset prices to expand. So where right now, in theory, mathematically, the housing market with everything going on should have corrected and should have crashed. The reason it hasn't is because prices, not values, prices have gone up. And we talk about this, it's known as inflation. And everyone says, there's no inflation. There's nothing on the horizon. Well, explain to me then how the gas prices have doubled. Explain to me how the grocery store, you go and buy food and stuff now, and the prices have gone up and the packages have shrunk. Or, or should I say, more comically, the packages are the same size, but you open it and there's this much inside. 
This is the inflation already. It's coming into the economy. Okay, that makes sense, 100%. So what I feel as a real estate agent myself, I'm dealing with clients who are looking to sell. I'm dealing with clients who are looking to buy. I'm going to new build constructions where it was once a $600,000 home. It's now a $750,000 home. I placed last night an offer of $60,000 over asking price, waiving appraisals, waiving contingencies, paying seller fees. And, and ordinarily, you wouldn't be doing that in a market a year, a year and a half ago. We're doing the complete opposite. And I'm getting the agent calling me saying that I'm sorry that your offer wasn't accepted. <laughs> I mean, when my client's putting 60K over, they're already planning their family. They're planning how they're going to swim in this pool. They're, they're excited. And it makes absolutely no sense. And when I go back to them, they want to have a heart attack. Like, how did we just lose, right? And they're getting frustrated and they're getting tired of it. But we have people who are coming who are paying 60, 70, 100,000 over price, but they're paying it cash. And they don't care about the appraisal value because there's no supply on the markets. There's so much demand and there's no supply. So do you feel that these stimulus packages are actually hurting the markets more than taking care of the markets? What's your take on that? Oh, 100%, they're, they're making it worse. And while a lot of people don't understand this, when they're getting say 1400 or $1,500 and they're, they're celebrating, that, 14 to 15, that, that, that money is costing them 10 times that. It's costing them maybe, well, in fact, even more than that. It, it can be costing them $20,000 in terms of the debt placed on them as a national debt per, per person. Because a lot of that stimulus that you saw, like the 1.9 trillion package, just do the mathematics on it. If you look at how many people there are, 330 million times that amount, it's nowhere near 1.9 trillion. It's a small amount of that. So where's all the rest of the money going? And it's going to bailing out things that shouldn't really be bailed out. I won't get into the politics of it, but you've got a very bad situation right now in the USA where all of this extra stimulus is just called, is, is going to cause a very, very big problem with inflation because you're not going to see wages rise. You can study right back. I, I've, been, I've gone back five, 600 years in terms of studying recessions, depressions, and all of that. Never, ever do the, ra the, the wages meet the, the rises in prices. And if you want me to comment based on, on what you were saying about, you know, the asking prices and paying 50, 60,000 over, it is purely down to the lack of inventory. Like you said, you're correct on that in the marketplace. So what's going to turn that around? Very simply, when interest rates go up, and let me be clear on this, because a lot of people misunderstand when I'm talking about interest rates. You have interest rates, i.e. Federal Reserve interest rates, and then you have mortgage interest rates, they are completely different things. And people don't, can't grasp this, you know, a lot of people, they're completely different. Mortgage interest rates can go up while the Federal Reserve interest rate can go down. They can even go negative and mortgage rates can go up. So when you get mortgage um, interest rates going up, it reduces the buying power of the person that wants to buy a house. Mm -hmm. And I won't get into all the percentages because it's, it gets a little bit complex, but that's exactly what happens. So if you were going to buy a, um, you know, a $300,000 house and interest rates got by 1%, well, now you would be in the 200s. You can't buy the same property for 300,000 because your buying power won't get as much. And another problem is as these rates go up, all these people are using their houses like they were in 2006 as ATMs, 50% of the GDP was from the housing market. People refinancing, taking all this money and just blowing it on hot tubs and new pools and, and all, you know, a new truck, brand new truck and all of this. And this is all going to cut. Look, we're, we're in the 2006, 2007 era right now. This is all going to end with a very big bang. I, and I agree with you 100%. There's two things that I want to touch on. The, the cash out refinances that are happening from the stats that I was reading. So from 2008 to where we are now in 2021 and 2008, the cash out refis were about 90%. So everybody who refinanced 90% of those took cash out in 2021. It was saying that one third of the people who do refinances do cash outs, which 33% is a, is still very significant. It's not at 08 numbers, but it's still significant. And, you know, I'm going to put this on myself. I have some investment properties and I cashed out on them about a hundred thousand dollars, but it wasn't 
to go buy that new uh, Tesla or that new bathtub or to buy something else. It was to switch that money to a different asset where I had another opportunity. But many are taking the cash outs and what they're doing with their money is they're upgrading their floor. They're fixing things that are not necessary or their kitchen. I mean, if you come and say I'm doing a cash out to fix my foundation because the piping underneath is going to break, I understand. But if you come and say, I just don't like my kitchen cabinet color and you did a 20K cash out, I think that that's dangerous and that's something that we're seeing happening. Now, mm. do you see the stimulus packages as a clear way of just delaying the markets from the inevitable and, and what really should be happening with the market's reaction? It's a little bit darker than that. So that's one part of it. But I, I see it. I, I don't want to get too sort of controversial on, on your show because I want to show you respect on your own channel. But I do see it as a lot darker than that. I think there's a, you know, a well, in every major recession, there will be certain groups and people who take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. And you probably heard the expression, never, get, never let a, a good crisis go to waste. And this is what's happening right now. So this, the stimulus, <clears throat> and if you look at one person I mentioned, which was Janet Yellen, mm -hmm. I said, she will probably be the next finance person with the, in the government, you know, the advisor and all that because she worked at the Federal Reserve, a private institution owned by shareholders. We have no idea who the shareholders are, mm -hmm. but I would be very surprised if, if Janet Yellen didn't own shares in the Federal Reserve. So for me, and by the way, Federal Reserve owns what, 35% of all the mortgages in the USA right now. Shocking, this shouldn't be allowed. And during the 08 crisis, when they were buying a load of them, they promised, they said that, that once things got back to normal, they would release those mortgages back into the supply. And I think this is another reason why the market only corrected 40% on average, call it, in the last recession, instead of really collapsing right down, because they were buying the mortgages, you see, mortgage-backed securities, again, complex topic. But they were doing this to stop the market collapsing, and they were supposed to release it again. So this time, they're doing exactly the same thing all over again, Federal Reserve, private institution creates money or currency is actually more accurately out of thin air. And then they put it into the monetary supply, which weakens the savers money. So if you're a saver and you've got money in the bank, your money is worth less every time they print more and more currency. And that is the biggest risk for people. A lot of people ask me, well, should I buy now? Should I wait? because they're concerned that their currency is de devaluing all the time. It's a very difficult topic. But to answer your question, I think there is something more sinister going on and certain organizations are taking advantage of all of this stimulus and they are basically just grabbing a lot of the money for themselves. Wow, that's, that's interesting that you say that because I, I feel that there's always a agenda behind the scenes that happens for a reason. I mean, I was, I was told by many people that if, if the economy is very dry and there isn't much movement, then they actually purposely create a war to create a ton of more movement with so many different industries. And these are coming from people who are top players, people who see this stuff, people who experience this stuff. And to create a war just to stimulate the economy is a whole different story. But there's many history channels and shows and things that talk about why wars even take place. And it gets very deep and very dark, just like you said. So I do see that happening. And, and I, see, I see people benefiting from something when the majority are actually getting affected by it. Now, as a landlord, you're a landlord, I'm a landlord, people who are watching this are landlords. Many of them if not all of them, me personally, I haven't been affected with it, which is great. But I know many people have been affected where the last year, maybe a year and a half, they have not collected rent. They have not got any rent from the tenants because the tenants are number one, probably very smart and know how to go around it because you just have to say that you've been affected. You kind of somewhat have to show some proof and then the landlord can't really evict you. You got eviction moratoriums, right? So they're having troubles and they're not able to collect rent, whether the stimulus packages are going to help them with some money or if it even reaches that mom and pop landlord who really don't have experience on how to even apply. Do you think that you're going to see landlords the second they can evict the tenants, they're going to evict them and they're just going to sell off their properties and somewhat be done with real estate? Yeah. So this is what happened during the last recession as well, which I went through personally. And this, this definitely 100% will happen 
with a proportion of those landlords. And I've even got a lot of landlords in some of my agencies who have said, Neil, as soon as we can evict these tenants, because we have the same in the UK as well, yeah. that's yeah. it. I'm putting it on the market because we have also a, an investment side of our real estate um, group. So we sell them on to other landlords and things like that. So we've already got loads of houses prepped. Lo I can't even tell you how many, maybe 40 or more. Wow. So it's a lot of houses that are already prepped to be sold to our investor database purely for that reason these rent moratoriums these uh, and again you've got mortgage forbearance you've got the unemployment all these things are just delaying it i think the usa now it's delayed to the 30th of june the last time i i, I checked and again what's that the third time they've extended it or, or more they're just going to keep extending it over and over again and it's and all it's doing is it's building up more and more momentum mm -hmm. for what's gonna be a very bad situation because you have to understand the psychology behind an amateur or a small, what you would say, a mom and pop landlord. They're doing it as a pension pot. I guarantee you, if I put a hundred of you landlords in this room right now, and I took a survey, 90% of them would say that it's their pension. This house is their pension for when they you know, retire. And when you've got that going on and all these situations are, are occurring for them, they don't want the hassle of it. Many landlords in the UK, it may be the same in the USA, doctors, pharmacists, you know, medical professionals, accountants, uh, legal professionals, people like that. Uh, and, and yes, again, you, you do get, you, you know, you, you, you average everyday people who have a lower salary, but that's the majority in, in the UK and other parts of, of Europe. And they don't want the hassle. Imagine you're a doctor and you're working long hours and you know, you don't want to be dealing with a hassle. And next thing you've got someone living in your property that, that just, they've said they can't pay the rent. But not only that, you have to pay the utilities. They're saying, I'm not paying the utilities. In some states, legally, you as a landlord have to pay the utilities on their behalf. God. It's absolutely insane. So a lot of people are underwater on their, on their property straight away. And I, 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 again, I, I know a lot of landlords who they have a separate bank account or they have SPV special purchase vehicles accounts for each property. And they're saying that they're literally taking money from their own bank account, their earnings every month. And they're having to put them into these accounts just to pay the utilities and the taxes and everything like that. That's the problem, Neil, is that you have these uh, mortgage forbearances, these eviction moratoriums, these even foreclosure moratoriums, yet the landlord still has to pay his property taxes, his property maintenance, his property insurance. He still has to show up and take care of these bills. So he's not collecting rent, yet he still has to pay all of this, which there's, there's so much unfairness to it. And many will, will comment and say the stimulus packages are helping the landlords as well. There's $30 billion from the recent stimulus package going to housing relief and such. But you got so many people who don't know how to even apply for that, don't even know about that, maybe not have that knowledge. You have landlords who are 50, 60, 70 year olds. They're, they're old school. They don't know anything about this. Hardly, you know, in, in America in specific, it's so many foreign investors. I have clients who can't even speak a couple words of English and they have over 10 million in real estate that I help them manage. So how are they going to even know how to fill an application for, Hey, let's go request mortgage forbearance for your properties. It just doesn't make sense. How are they going to, how are they going to file for the housing relief and stuff? So I see things really getting in a way crooked and eventually something's going to have to impact, you know, on all my videos that I share, I keep saying that they're kicking the can down the road. They're just delaying and delaying and delaying. I don't know when will they ever stop. Are people just going to get used to it? Are people just going to expect a helicopter to drop $2 trillion every year, or every six months? I really don't know. So, you know, when I talk to you, I feel like uh, we have very, very similar philosophies. And that's a huge reason why I watch all your videos. I take all the notes and I respect everything that you talk about. And that's why I was like, let's make a video because the audience that I have will, will appreciate and value what it is that you give. So in short, a housing crash, are we looking, you know, after everything we shared and stuff, are we looking to see that in the near future, three months, six months, or are we looking if it were to even happen could be after at least one year plus two years, three years, and even depending on how much they keep kicking the can down the road. Yeah. Yeah. And it's actually a very difficult question to answer. So I, 
honestly, hand on heart, thought we would have had a correction by now. Mm -hmm. And this was before the stimulus, you see, before they started doing all of this stimulus. So I think it was June last year I made the, the very detailed video. I recommend everyone go and watch that. And it's called how the housing market crash will happen. Something like that. It's on my channel. I'm going to link it down below for you guys. I'm going to link it up in the cards and then also I'll link it below so they can check that out. Okay. Yeah. And I, I was shocked when that got 1.8 million views. Wow. Uh, you know, it, it was, it was probably my best piece of work though, in terms of putting everything together. So people understand everything that would happen. And really the only point that hasn't happened was the, the, the timeline that I expected about by now, this sort of time, springtime, we'd start seeing a correction. Mm -hmm. So here's why that didn't happen. It's not that my forecast was wrong or anything like that. I, I use the analogy, imagine you're playing soccer or we call it football in England and you kick the ball into the goal, but the players grab that net and they lift it and they run backwards and yeah. the ball falls short. That is the equivalent of all of this new currency creation or the new stimulus because it's made people think and feel like they're richer. It's made people think their houses are going up in, in value and they're becoming super rich. And human beings have a very strange notion in that they, when things are going good, they expect it to continue. They never, I can't remember the psychological term, but they don't expect it to ever end. And that's why you get these frenzies like the roaring twenties where Everyone, even the, what do they say? The dustbin sweeper, I think they called them, which is like the, the refuse collectors were in the stock market, right? Everyone was in the stock market, the baker, the butcher, because people think it's never going to end. Yeah. And um, what was your question again? Because sometimes I can waffle on. Uh, no, no, you're good. You know, you know, my thing, Neil, is that the stock market that you mentioned it, I was shorting the stock market for, for about minimum eight months. I mean, any stock... I was saying it's going to go down because I, I was like, there has to be a crash. There has to be a retrace. There's no way that you're filing for all quarters, a 1 billion plus loss and your stock price is going to go up. And the funny thing is, is every one that I shorted, I lost on because mm -hmm. they all kept going up. So it just made no sense. Uh, the, the question that I asked you was just general about the housing crash and the housing market now, but you gave a good okay. answer on that, but you can. No, no, I've got it. I, I actually, let me finish on that because I want to, I want to, be full on that. Okay. So in the next three to six months, specifically if we're talking USA, I can't see a correction in most major areas. The one that I forecast accurately, and it was the main, main one that I forecast was New York. Mm -hmm. And I knew what would happen there because of the mass exodus going on. So that was very, very accurate. And actually there's a video on my channel. It's called accurate forecast or something like that. The playlist and Barbara Kokora, you know, the one from Shark Tank and all that very famous woman, she was telling people, get your bids in now, get your bids in now into New York. And I said, no, do not get your bids in now. New York is going down. Wow. And uh, a couple of weeks after that, it just started crashing. And that's just because of the fundamental analysis that I do. So three to six months, there's too much stimulus going on. And we also don't know the end of when the stimulus will come. So if they just keep doing more and more stimulus, there's not going to be a crash. It's just going to keep going. It's going to keep going up. As soon as they stop the stimulus, this is when you're going to see maybe a period of a couple of months of, of panic, three months, I don't know. So what we do is as human beings, we look at other people and we say, what are they doing? What are they? Because we're pack animals. So we look to one another. And then most of the time people just freeze. They don't do anything. And then when you see the first wildebeest start running and panicking and bolting, everyone else goes, oh, wait, wait, I should bolt. But if you're at the back, you don't know what the pack's doing until it shuffles through to you. And then you have this all out panic. And we've seen this in the stock market as well in previous um, recessions and depressions. You just have this panic and everyone starts selling. But at that point, it'll be too late because the inventory will have reversed. Mm -hmm. Interest rates will probably be a bit higher as well. So you're going to have maybe five or six fundamentals working against your cell. So this is one of the reasons I sold out of my real estate, um, the ones I owned as a landlord. And people say, yeah, you, you know, they love trolling me. Yeah, you made a mistake. You sold too early. But what these people don't understand is that it's not about timing the market. If Ray Dalio can't time the market, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Jim Rogers, all the top people, if they can't time the market, 
then no one really who's an amateur investor can time the market. So for me, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to risk that. So for me, you know, there's different asset classes, which is probably outside the scope of this video between tangible, intangible and getting returns. So I'm sat on about 140% return this year. I got 132 roughly percent last year. So for me, it's not really about um, timing things. It's just about following fundamentals, investing really smart and going that way. But again, because I get off track really easily, Karen. So three to six months, I don't see a, a correction. I don't see a crash. But after that, if they were to stop the, the stimulus, yeah, I, I can see things starting to go bad. All of this new currency that's just coming into the supply is just driving up asset prices. The money has to go somewhere. When that money starts going round, it's called the velocity of money. It has to end up in the commercial banks because someone gets the money. Let's say you buy a bottle of water. Well, that money goes to that person, that shopkeeper. The shopkeeper puts it in their bank then it, it, and it keeps getting loaned out to different people. Another person withdraws it. All of the money has to go somewhere and it keeps going round and round in circles. Commercial banks don't want to hold money. They want to get it out. And what do they loan on? Businesses and real estate. Businesses are doing really badly right now. So this is a huge risk for all the banks. And they're already over leveraged. So just be careful with leaving money in the bank. And the second one is real estate. As long as the real estate market, the stock market hold up, everything's fine. But as soon as these, and it doesn't matter which one corrects first, it will pull the other one down with it. Okay. And that's the thing that most people aren't talking about. Most economists, they never talk about this. If one goes, the other will go. And it doesn't matter which way it goes first. They'll, they'll pull each other down. Because in the stock market as well, you have all the REITs, real estate investment trusts. You, you know, it, it gets quite uh, intricate when we go down this road. Makes sense. I appreciate you giving the breakdown and I'm not even going to talk back on saying, I, I agree with exactly what you said. hundred percent. I think the minute stimulus packages come to an end, I see a couple of months could be three to six months again of just the market trying to figure out where to go, what to do. Demand starts to kind of diminish supply starts to pick up interest rates start to pick up. And, and like you mentioned earlier in the video, mortgage interest rates in specific start to pick up. Um, I did a video on, Basically, if you bought a house for $400,000 and you got it at a 5.5% interest rate, and today you decided to buy a house for a 3% interest rate, instead of qualifying for a $400,000 home, you now qualify for the same monthly mortgage, a $540,000 home. A little bit complicated or confusing maybe, but two years ago, I signed with a client to buy a 400K home, 5.5% was his rate. Two years later, if you wanted to get that same monthly mortgage, he can buy with the 3% rate in today's market, a $540,000 home. So this, this just gives a fact of what you said earlier is when interest rates go up or go down or vice versa, then you kind of get pushed out of that 300K range, you fall to the 200K range because the monthly mortgage payment is now unaffordable for you. So, you know, so what you're saying makes, makes complete sense. Do you see when the eviction moratoriums end and the mortgage forbearance end, do you see a wave of foreclosures a wave of evictions happening? You know, I don't know if I see a wave. I definitely see it having an impact. But I think the biggest thing you need to look out for everyone is when all the unemployment ends, mm -hmm. right? In California, where I live, there's all these, we are hiring, we are hiring everywhere on all the fast food type of joints. Not that I eat fast food, of course. <laughs> but you know, when you go through the drive through we are hiring and you're like, why, why is that? So I spoke to this guy who I know, he's a manager of a you know, fast food outlet. I said to him, why are all the signs saying we are hiring? It's $15 minimum wage here. Surely you should have you know, loads of people. And he said, yeah, but they're getting $300 a week unemployment plus stimulus checks. No one wants to come back to work or no one wants to work. So the people that have left, we need to rehire. We're struggling to get people, even at $15 an hour, because they're getting $300 on unemployment. And that's one of the other challenges we've got in the economy now. When I made a video just last week on UBI, Universal Basic Income with Lynette Zhang, and that was a very, very good video. I recommend everyone watch that. Okay. Because this is potentially something that could come next, UBI in, in the future. It's either gonna be UBI or they're gonna just pull the rug 
and say, okay, that's it, everyone back to work. But it's going to, either way, if we get onto the unemployment aspect, unemployment numbers are faked. They are not true, what the government puts out. They put out something called U3, when it should be U6, but they also don't take into account the labor market um, statistics. So those people who are no longer interested, they're no longer looking, it could be a homemaker, it could be all sorts of things. They're not taking into account these statistics. So if you are unemployed in the last six months or so, let's just say, then they'll count you. But if you're over six months or you know, there's another situation going on, they just won't even include you. So these statistics are nowhere near what they should be. So you imagine when all of this ends and everyone needs to go back to work, the unemployment rate is going to be so bad. And what do you need to get a mortgage? You need to show income, yeah. right? Unless you're like a foreign investor and you can get you know, a foreign investment mortgage or something like that, which are not easy to get. Um, I know I've been through it many times, right? It is going to be difficult. So I see the unemployment aspect as being the biggest fundamental problem that, that is going to hit the marketplace. That's crazy. I feel that you have in your brain a lot of things that you're seeing uh, when you say like maybe the dark market or the black markets or the behind the scenes scope. I feel like you have a lot of knowledge on that because you, you speak to high profile people who are actually behind the scenes doing the stuff. So that's so interesting that you say things because when you say them, I take them from a different perspective. And everybody who's watching this video right now, if you're getting value from Neil, getting value from me, hit that like button. It is going to show that you guys support, you guys like this video and content like this. And most importantly, everybody who's watching this video, you're questioning, should you buy a house? Should you not buy a house? Is the market going to collapse? Is it going to crash? What's going to maybe happen in the near future? We're not giving predictions of this is set in stone. We're just sharing with you what we're seeing as facts, what we're seeing as we read, as we get educated and talk to others. But at the end of the day, be protected and make the move that you feel is the best for you, for you and for your family. When Neil sh uh, shares what he's saying right now, it's based off of all his experiences being in the real estate market in 08, being in the real estate market with big time investors himself and other people that he works with. He's the CEO of companies as well. So he's not just making a video, he's in the game, he's on the field and he's seeing it every single day. And, and that's why um, I'm, I'm blessed to have you on the channel right now. I'm blessed to have you in making this video. So I appreciate that. Now we spoke about the housing market. We spoke about stimulus packages. We spoke interest rates. We spoke about forbearances, moratoriums. Really, we grabbed as much as we could about the housing market in specific, and we're coming to an end right now. So what I want to ask from you, Neil, is what is your point to everybody who's watching this video? This is kind of another curveball at you. Just give us you know, your final takeaway about the housing market and maybe someone who's watching is kind of scared. They don't know what to do, if they should buy a house right now or if they should wait it out. They have the money, the finances, they, they want to make the move, but they just don't have the confidence because of these videos, because of what's happening. They're just doubtful right now. So what kind of advice do you have for those who are watching this video? Yeah, I, I mean, I think they should be doubtful. I think they should be scared because when you're scared, it makes you a lot more cautious and it makes you think things through um, straight away. It's like, like why they put candy, you know, just before the checkout at the supermarket. You're not thinking. So you just instantly grab it and you put it in and you eat it, right? You know, yeah. you want to you wanna take time and you want to be cautious and you really want to think about this. You, you've really got to take your time and be patient. So, you know, in my mind, because it's very complex and there's 30 to 40 variables at play here, let me try and make it simple for you, but this isn't the perfect answer. And that is, I would either buy now get a 30 year fixed rate mortgage with the intention that you're not going to be moving house or even a 20 year fixed rate, whatever you're going to get lock in that low rate and just say, look, I'm not going to be moving from this property. So it doesn't really matter what happens to the housing market. Cause if it crashes, it will go back up after 20 years, you know, whatever. So there's one point or I would wait until there was a crash. To me, there really isn't any middle ground between those two. I would either wait for a crash or I would buy right now. But then if you know, if you two, three years later, and let's say there wasn't a crash for whatever reason, 
all this UBI and central bank digital currencies come in and all this other stuff, there wasn't a crash. It's not really a case then of saying, okay, now I'm going to buy because you really should have bought now when prices were, yes, they're, they're highly inflated. But if you get that low rate fixed rate mortgage, it doesn't really matter. If it's affordable, it's an affordable monthly payment, you're working, your spouse is working, whoever, then look, it's a home. If you're looking to buy rental properties, investment properties, personally, I wouldn't. But again, if you can get those low rate mortgages, then fine, you can, you can do that. But um, that's probably the best guidance that I can, I can give around it is that if you're going to buy and you've got your mind made up, you're going to buy and it's a family home. It's not an investment anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And you need that extra space. You don't want to be in the city. You don't want to be in a condo in the city if everything goes really, really bad. One thing we didn't touch upon is, is what's going on right now, which is, which is quite important. And that's the K-shaped economy that's going on. And throughout history, whenever you have these K-shaped, they every single study and time that I've looked at it right, right the way back, it either ends in political uh, measures. And what I mean by that is some people are getting extremely rich while the middle class and the poor are getting poorer through the inflation. A lot of the inflation hasn't even hit yet because it's often 12 to 18 months behind the new currency printing. Mm. So with all of that going on, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. And there's going to be a point where there'll be a, a turning point in the psychology of people in their minds. And if you want to see a perfect example of this, look up what happened to the king during the French Revolution. And let's just say it involved a, a square, his army moving out the way, and the people took him. And uh, there was also a guillotine involved. So not to get too scary on it, but this is what happens. You have these k-shaped um, economies and they always end in a bad way so that's one thing you've got to look at i wouldn't want to be in a condo in a big city if everything went really bad so if you're thinking to yourself should i move should i get a house with more space and things like that you've really got to weigh up whether you're going to buy it right now um, with the risk of there could be a correction and house prices could come down or you just wait it out, but then you've just got to wait until it, it does. And, and what if there's never a housing correction, which, you know, extremely unlikely, but you've really got to take these things into account. I love that. I take that 100% and I, and I share similar. to. So what I typically would say is that if you have finances that are there and that are affordable to buy, pay your closing costs, pay everything related to moving your furniture, Plus you have 12 months of savings to completely survive. If you made no money at all and you're ready, you've been waiting for a couple of years, your family's outgrown the place, it might make sense. But just like Neil said, if you're doing investment properties, I wouldn't rush it. I mean, I had a guy message me the other day saying to buy an investment property, there was about 10, 20,000 in profit to make, just wasn't worth the risk with everything that we're dealing with right now. So I just didn't take it. Right now, I think what you buy or what you do can, can be what happens to you in the future. If the, if the housing market just goes down 10, 20% on a $400,000 home, you're almost now at 20% worth $300,000. That's massive. You basically lost your entire down payment that you put into a house. So I take what you say and, and I agree with that. And for everybody watching who's considering it, be very cautious, make the move with a million numbers that you run and understand that anything can happen and do understand you can be waiting for three, five, 10 more years. We just don't know. I'm not saying it's going to be that long, but we don't know how long they can keep delaying and extending. You got some people who say we're becoming a communist uh, country, right? So you have everybody throwing out their input in this world. And, and at, this, at this moment, just play smart. And that's what I'm going to leave you all off with. Anyways, Neil, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been a blessing. It has been awesome. The man himself, 283,000 loyal subscribers, that 1.8 million viewed video. I'm going to definitely link it up because people are going to want to see it. You also mentioned another video that I'm going to also link up. I'll get the links from you after. And then most importantly, everybody who watched, please don't forget to hit that like button. Please don't forget to go to Neil's channel. If you're not already there, click subscribe on his channel. He's got solid content, a guy that I can relate to that shares the same philosophy like me. So if you like what I say, you're going to love what he says. And he has a ton of connections and a ton of amazing people he brings on the channel. Anyways, everybody, thank you so much for watching. 
hit that subscribe on this channel, the link below, click that link and then go to the Discord channel and sign up, it's for free. We talk daily about real estate, money and business. I'd love to see you all there. And you don't know, maybe Neil makes a special appearance in the Discord channel and says what's up to everybody. So for everybody watching, go join it. Thank you so much, Neil, and God bless you all. I'll see you all later, we're out. All right, thanks guys. God bless everyone.